Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Justin D'Souza. I'm a quantitative analyst here at Statistics Solutions. During today's webinar, we are going to discuss how to construct quantitative research questions and hypotheses. If you have any questions during the webinar, uh, please type them into the chat box. And at the end of the webinar, I will go through those questions. We'll do a Q&A session at the end. All right, so our company is Statistic Solutions. Statistic Solutions provides assistance with virtually every portion of the dissertation, starting with topic development and going through the discussion chapter and preparation for defense. In the middle, we do assist with prospectus and concept papers, depending on what college you go to. We assist with the proposal chapters. The way our company works is we assign both a methodologist to you and a literature review specialist. So they are specialized in those respective areas of the dissertation. We assist with both quantitative and qualitative research. We help with IRB forms, data entry templates, and uploading your survey on the SurveyMonkey. We also help with the quantitative and qualitative results chapters. And we assist with PowerPoints for defense and journal publications. So if you're interested in a free 30-minute consultation, please schedule with Janine using this link at the bottom of the slide. My colleague Isades is going to provide some links in the chat box uh, for scheduling consultations, also a list of our previous webinars and webinars that we will be conducting in the future. So for today's topic, we're discussing constructing research questions. But before we get to that point, we need to lay the groundwork. Um, so we need to first discuss, are you doing a quantitative or qualitative study? So quantitative studies involve collection of data in a numerical format. And that format can be assigned to categories or rank or measurements and units. But we typically use statistics to address the research questions and hypotheses. Whereas qualitative research involves the study of concepts or phenomenon and usually requires interviewing participants. Um, so a quantitative study proves something with statistical significance, whereas qualitative is uncovering the underlying theme behind a concept. Before you develop your research questions, you first need to identify what is your research problem. Typically, there is a gap in the literature that you need to find for your topic, something that has not been conducted before, something that is unique, uh, something that is new to your field. And you have to do a review of the literature to identify this research objective. 
typically in my experience, if people have a difficult time finding a gap in the literature, a way to do it is by localizing your study. So taking your overarching idea and maybe pinpointing it to a specific location, a geographic location, that can be a way to make your study more unique. After identifying your research problem and you've pinpointed that you want to proceed in a quantitative approach, you need to identify all the key variables of interest in your study. Are these variables numerically measurable? And are you going to need to use a self-report survey or can you find archival data to measure these variables? So if you use a self-report survey, you'll want to consider using something that's previously validated as opposed to developing your own survey that comes with its own hurdles, such as doing a pilot test and validating that tool through factor analysis. That can add many months to your project, so I would recommend using a previously validated survey. And if you can find an archival data source, that's even quicker uh, because the data already exists. There are four major quantitative research designs that go together. You'll want to identify your research design before formulating your research questions. We have a descriptive exploratory design. We have correlational designs. We have experimental, quasi-experimental, or causal comparative. Those all kind of go together. And we have longitudinal designs. So let's start with the descriptive and exploratory component. So descriptive or exploratory research design is rather simplistic in that it's not attempting to prove or disprove hypotheses, meaning you don't always get a level of significance that there is a significant relationship or significant differences between groups. It's more trying to describe trends in your sample. So I've provided a couple sample research questions here. What are the trends in job satisfaction among teaching faculty? Or what is the predominant leadership style used among managers in a workplace? We're not trying to prove anything in these research questions with the level of significance. We're just outlining what are the trends in the sample. Questions like these are usually addressed through what's called exploratory data analysis, which, are, which consists of using descriptive statistics like frequencies and percentages of the survey items or examining the means and standard deviations of the variables. So in my experience, if you're going with a descriptive exploratory design, this is, like I said, kind of simplistic. Some committees might not be on board with this. It really depends on your college, but it's definitely one of the most efficient ways to get through the dissertation. Uh, many colleges now require a test of significance. You might have to go a more complicated route. The next design is a correlational design. So it's a little complicated with the nomenclature. Um, a correlational design is actually an umbrella concept that branches off into two possibilities. You can have correlational analyses or you can have regression analyses. So correlational analyses are looking at two-way associations. You don't necessarily need to have an independent or dependent variable. You just need two variables of interest. A regression analysis is used when you're trying to predict an outcome. So you have a group of predictors or independent variables and you're trying to predict a dependent variable, sometimes called a criterion variable. We have some examples of research questions here. Is there a significant, significant correlation, relationship, association? Those words are synonymous. Uh, between X and Y. So here we can see, is there a significant relationship between age and self-efficacy? We just have two variables of interest and you don't have an independent or dependent variable necessarily. You're looking to see how 
age fluctuates with, with self-efficacy and vice versa. So you don't have prediction, you don't have one variable impacting another. It's looking at the two-way association. Likewise with, is there in a significant association between education and job position? So down here, we have the most common correlational analyses that are used for such a research question as this right here. We have piercing correlations, which are used between two continuous variables. So something like research question one here. If age is a continuous variable, meaning you're, you have a fill in the blank response on your survey, we have a specific age, then this is a continuous variable. And if self-efficacy is measured through a survey of Likert scale questions, and you take an average of those items to measure self-efficacy, that would also be a continuous variable. A Spearman correlation is a non-parametric version of a Pearson correlation. So it doesn't have the strict assumptions of normality or linearity. Um, but this is used when you're testing for the relationship between an ordinal item and another variable that's either continuous or ordinal. So research question one could also work for this if age was a multiple choice response. So if age, you had cutoffs like 18 to 25, 26 to 30, 31 to 35. If you don't have the specific age, but it's an ordinal variable that goes up a hierarchy or a ladder, then that is the time to use the Spearman correlation. Chi-square test of independence is used when you're testing the relationship between two categorical or nominal variables. The research question two is an example of that. Uh, if education is a multiple choice response, less than high school, high school, bachelor's, associates, so forth, and you have job position, maybe manager, owner, employee, CEO, um, that would be an example. You have two nominal variables there. You can do a chi-square test of independence. Okay, and uh, on this slide, I discussed the hypotheses. So formulating hypotheses is really easy. You just take your research question and you rephrase it a bit. So you have a null hypothesis, which is signified with this H not, H zero. And you have an alternative hypothesis. Sometimes it's H A or H one. Um, you're just, you're identifying what you're trying to prove. Uh, we're usually trying to disprove our null hypothesis. So you say there is not a significant relationship between X and Y, and then for the alternative, there is a significant relationship. So we are trying to disprove that the null hypothesis is true, and we're trying to support the alternative. Generally, that's what statistics are trying to prove. Disprove your null and prove your alternative. So the other branch to a correlational design consists of using regressions. So as I mentioned before, a regression is trying to predict a dependent variable or a criterion variable is what it's called. So you'll see the word predict in the research question. Is there a significant predictive relationship between X and Y? I've given some examples here. There are many ways to phrase these. You can have one predictor and one outcome. You can have three predictors as I have here, uh, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and personal accomplishment. You can have three predictors at once trying to predict an outcome. And you can have a categorical outcome such as passing and failing an exam. So depending on what your outcome measurement is, it's going to determine what regression type you need to use. So if you have a continuous outcome variable, self-efficacy, as I defined before, if that's a survey of Likert scale questions that is measuring self-efficacy, you would use a linear regression. And once you add multiple predictors into it, it becomes a multiple linear regression. A binary logistic regression is used when you're trying to predict a dichotomous outcome. 
So sample question three would apply here. How does GPA predict passing and failing of an exam? So if pass and fail is dichotomous, there are two distinct, two distinct groups. So that would be a logistic regression. A multinomial logistic regression is taking that binary idea and just expanding it further. So it's used when you have a categorical variable with more than two groups. So if you had an outcome like education level, or um, as I mentioned before, maybe job position, something that's categorical that might have more than two groups, that's when you use a multinomial logistic regression. And an ordinal logistic regression is used when you have an ordinal dependent variable. So that's something like age, if you're trying to predict age, if it was multiple choice, or GPA, if it was multiple choice. You could even consider something like education. As I mentioned, it's kind of an overlap between education being a nominal or ordinal variable. The argument can be made that education is an ordinal variable because there's a natural progression to the variable, high school, bachelor's, master's, PhD. So you could use an ordinal regression there as well. Here are the examples of the hypotheses, very similar to before. No alternative, there is not a predictive relationship. There is a predictive relationship. The next group of designs uh, kind of all go together, uh, depending on what your specific goal is, there might be a better one to use, or one of these might be a better approach than the others. Um, so we have experimental, quasi-experimental, and causal comparative. And these are typically used to check for differences in between discrete groups. So for this, you need to have an independent variable which is your grouping factor, and you need to have a dependent variable, which is what you're trying to test for differences between. So an experimental based question has the following format. Is there a significant difference in Y between the groups of X? So a little bit different than before, the key difference is we have the word difference here as opposed to predict or correlate. And you typically list your dependent variable first, followed by your grouping variable or your independent variable. So an example here, is there a significant difference in job satisfaction between treatment and control? We have two discrete groups there. There's a significant difference in self-efficacy based on race. The race consists of multiple groups, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, um, and you can even look at multiple dependent variables at once. So emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, personal accomplishment by race. And you can even look at that same examination while controlling for an additional factor. Okay, so each one of these research questions would use a different analysis. So as we come down here, Research question one would use an independent sample t-test. And the reason is because we have a continuous dependent variable, job satisfaction, and we have two discrete groups, treatment and control. Once you add an, another group to the equation, like race, if it's white, black, Asian, Hispanic, other, um, then you have an ANOVA at that point. You can't just do a t-test. And when you incorporate multiple dependent variables, like in research question three, we do a MANOVA there, which stands for a multivariate analysis of variance. And if you're looking at differences while controlling for a variable, then you do an ANCOVA or a MANCOVA. The C in there stands for covariance. So an analysis of covariance or a multivariate analysis of covariance. Here are the sample hypotheses. Again, same idea, null alternative. The next type of design is a longitudinal design. So this is 
opposed to a cross-sectional approach. Longitudinal design is looking for differences over time in a variable. Now this can overlap with experimental designs. So you could be looking at an intervention. You have treatment and control groups, but you, you also have a pre-test and post-test component. If that's the case, that's a true experimental design. Um, you've potentially randomly assigned people to treatment and control, and then you're running a simulation and you're seeing if there are differences before and after. You, the, the main requirement of the longitudinal design is that you need a dependent variable that is measured multiple times. So say you're measuring uh, job satisfaction before and after a workshop that's been done. Um, you need to match the people between the pretest and post-test. So you want the same person that takes the pretest. you want to link their post-test score on the same row on your spreadsheet. Um, so you can also factor in a grouping variable as we discussed, you could have a treatment and control. So then you have a time component and you have a grouping component. So here's an example of a longitudinal based question. Is there a significant difference and why between time one and time two? Why is your dependent variable? Is there a significant difference in knowledge between pre-test and post-test of educational intervention? You can have more than two time points, baseline, post-test, and follow-up. And you could even have, is there a difference over time and between groups? So each of those research questions ties to a specific analysis down here. If you just have a pre and post component, that would be a dependent sample t-test also called a paired sample t-test. If you have three or more points in time that you're comparing, that would be a repeated measures of NOVA. And if you're taking the differences of time and looking for a comparison between groups and time, then you do a mixed model ANOVA. So when you do a mixed model ANOVA, you have three components. You have a between subjects effect, which is your comparison between groups, treatment control. You have a comparison over time that's called your within subjects effect. And you have the interaction effect, which is taking your groups and combining it with the time. So imagine you have a grid of four possibilities. You have pre-test control, post-test control, pre-test treatment, post-test treatment. And that interaction effect is analyzing for all four differences. Here are the sample research questions. So the final analysis that I just described, that would be for sample question two here. And like I said, there are three components. We have, is there a difference in knowledge over time in between groups? You have three hypotheses here, potentially. Is there a difference in knowledge over time? Is there a difference in knowledge between groups? And is there a difference in knowledge over time and between groups? That is the interaction effect. So in summary, uh, you first need to lay the groundwork for your purpose statement, identify a gap in the literature, formulate a purpose statement, uh, look for your theoretical framework to support your study, then select a quantitative or qualitative approach, identify your variables of interest and what is the level of measurement for each variable. Is it nominal, is it ordinal, or is it interval? Determine if you're going to use a survey or collect data through an archival spreadsheet or a secondary source, select your research design, exploratory, correlational, or experimental, and longitudinal are all possibilities. Then develop your research questions and hypotheses following this appropriate design, and then determine what analyses are best to address those questions and hypotheses. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're now going to do a Q&A session on this slide to cover what our company provides in terms of services. 
If you've hit a roadblock, uh, please schedule a consultation with Janine using this link. We are going to send everybody a copy of the PowerPoint today and a copy of the presentation. Uh, so yeah, let us know if you have any questions. I'll now open up the chat to any additional questions so you can type those in. So we have a question that asks, how do you find previously validated surveys? That's a great question. Um, so let me go onto Google here. And in my experience, I've had some luck on this website here. It's called mids.org. And you can search for keywords on this website. So say you're looking for a stress inventory or a stress survey, you can search for that and it will pull up different previously validated surveys. Um, so if I click on this one here, perceived stress scale, it gives you references, it gives you the primary use, the background, psychometrics for reliability and validity. And sometimes if you're lucky at the bottom here, it even gives you the survey itself. So here's a Word document with the PSS and it gives you scoring instructions. If you don't find it there, um, you might want to email the authors directly who developed this instrument and see if they have previously validated information for the survey. How did they establish it to be a reliable tool? And can they send you the scoring instructions? Other than that, you can go on Google and say we do the same thing, stress, survey. I'll type previously validated and NCBI. NCBI is a database that has many articles. Um, so you'll see a lot of links here when you do that. And if you just click on one, Sometimes it doesn't have the whole article. You might have to pay for a subscription on here. I don't have one. And this one happens to have the full article, which is great. Uh, but you'll find reliability and validity support in NCBI. OK, uh, we have a question from Laura about doing research during COVID and modeling, controlling for potential confounds in COVID research. I think I would need to know more specifically uh, what the question is. Unfortunately, I can't unmute for this because it, it might disrupt my internet with so many people on the webinar. So if you can type that into the chat box, I'll see if I can help you out. If we have any additional questions, you can type those into the chat box. Will we be hypothesizing macroid COVID variables in our hypotheses or controlling for them? I think that's a literature-based question. So if previous literature has used factors like that as a control, then it's not necessarily your independent variable or your predictor. It may just be something that you're holding constant. Um, it's something that you're accounting for when you're looking at your relationship. So you can do something like a hierarchical linear regression where you put in your control variables in first, and then you add your key predictors in the second step of the model. I'll put that in the chat box. Um, it's called a hierarchical linear regression. And that's if you're using covariates or control variables. Uh, we have a question for a binary outcome. What stats test do you do? I would recommend a binary logistic regression for that. So let me go back to the slide. Right here, so that's kind of the example sample research question three. Is there a significant predictive relationship between GPA and passing failing an exam? 
passing failings binary. So you would use a binary logistic regression there. Oh yeah, I forgot to include the link for the surveys. Let me do that uh, in the chat box. Mids.org, uh, let me know if you see that. Okay, question from Rob. I presented a hypothetical model. Could you help me develop research questions? Yeah, I mean, um, you can schedule a consultation with Janine and she will assign a statistician to you and they can help you develop research questions. So just let Janine know where you need assistance. Um, it's just formulating research questions that can probably be done in an hour or so. But if you also need help, uh, developing the analyses that you need to use, we can help you with that as well. Kind of like a, a data analysis plan that would go in your methodology. And we have a question, if doing statistical analyses from data collected from interviews and qualitative research and comparing two or more answers from the interviews, what stats tools test would you use? It's difficult to use statistics when looking at qualitative research unless you, you're able to put those open-ended responses into themes, so distinct theme so you have common responses among the participants it might just be descriptive statistics you know just frequencies and percentages for how people are responding to those you could also potentially use a chi-square test of independence so let me open the spreadsheet here or the powerpoint and on this slide here we have the sample question, is there a significant association between education and job position? That would be a chi-square test of independence. So if your two questions are nominal and they're open-ended and you're able to collapse those responses into themes for both questions, then you could use a chi-square test there. We have suggestions on developing mixed methods, research questions, and purpose statements. That's a really specific question. I'm not a qualitative expert either. We do have a, a separate webinar with qualitative specialists. Um, so I wouldn't be able to pinpoint a mixed method research question. Um, in my experience, they're usually split. But you'll have a separate section for quantitative research questions and then qualitative research questions. Usually going to be split completely into a separate section. If we do a survey and interviews, do we include both types of questions? Need to know a little bit more information for that. So a survey, I'm assuming, is going to be multiple choice. Um, you can always use statistics to examine those multiple choice responses. Uh, if you're doing interviews, you're probably using a qualitative approach there. Maybe a phenomenology, maybe grounded theory. Um, so there's a completely different analysis for that. Okay, do we have any additional questions?
Yep. Thank you, Simon, for joining us. Come join us again. Thanks, Maria. Do we have any additional questions? Glad you joined us, Patricia. So in the chat box, I say he's provided the free 30 minute consultation link with Janine. Janine will discuss where you're heading a roadblock in your dissertation and uh, how we can best assist. And then she will assign a methodologist to you or a literature review specialist, depending on where you need help. I say he's also provided the links for the future webinars we, we are conducting and the past webinar recordings, webinars we have already done. Okay, I'll stay on for a few more minutes if we have any final questions. Come join us for our future webinars. Uh, as I said, he's provided the links. You can see what we are conducting in the future. Let us know if you have any questions and uh, have a great evening.